All right. Welcome, guys. This is the Difference Makers podcast. My name is Justin Tamani. I will be your host today. Today we have with us, and back for a second time, first repeat guest is Dr. Jessica Metcalf. Dr. Jessica Metcalf is a, I was about to say, is a dentist, but no, we're, we're branching outside of just dentistry. We're talking about different things today. So, Je- uh, Jess, you were on the show before, and we talked a lot about mindset and self, uh, not self sabotage, excuse me. We talked a lot about, um, oh, I'm drawing a big blank. This is my fault. We talked a lot about um, <laughs> imposter syndrome. There we go. There we go. I'm trying to get the words out. We talked about a lot about imposter syndrome. And here today, we're going to change it up a little bit and we're going to kind of lead towards uh, self sabotage behaviors and how that impacts us um, either on a daily basis or tying it into you know training and and kind of i guess it's across all things in life Mm -hmm. so welcome to the show thank you thank you so much for having me back i could see you processing and trying to process so fast (laughs) yeah i was i'm on this episode so i was like you know we were just talking before the show and i'm like getting ready i'm in my mindset and then i was like wait what the heck did we talk about last time i don't remember but no i do but yeah No, I really, I'm so excited to talk about self-sabotage because we can be our own worst enemies at times, as super cliche as it is, but it all comes back to how we choose to speak to ourselves. So I'm super excited to get into all of the questions that you have for me today. Yeah. So catch us up. What have you been doing recently before we dive too deep in everything? What, what's, uh, what's your life been like in the last six months since we, we talked, we, we got some big things going on in your life right now. Yeah. So I'm actually in the middle of a rebrand right now. So that means initially I was coaching and teaching individuals within the healthcare sphere. And now I am branching outside of that and opening it up for athletes, for businesses, for corporations, and really looking to make a difference on how to change how we choose to speak to ourselves. So as that is all happening, it's really interesting to see the change and the connections of who is now reaching out to me saying, hey, I feel stuck and I'm really connecting with your message. Can we work together? And you had said it, it's very universal how we can self-sabotage. And in doing that, if I can spread more awareness around that and give you the information to then make those changes, then you can start to apply them to not just your sport, but to your personal life and to your work life as well. And that's so important that this is a huge topic. This isn't just sport. Like this is life, professional, uh, like interpersonal relationships, everything. So it I mean, crosses everywhere and you can apply that knowledge in every aspect of life. Yeah. So like, how would you define self-sabotage? Like, what would you define that as? And I mean, it's it kind of, to me, like just saying the word self-sabotage, like it's pretty straightforward, but how would you define that? So self-sabotage is when you knowingly or unknowingly set yourself up to keep yourself stuck. And when I say you do it knowingly and unknowingly, a lot of the times on why we keep ourselves stuck is happening unconsciously because we forget to ask ourselves what we want in life, what makes us happy. And when we forget to ask ourselves those simple questions, yet very complex answers then we can really self-sabotage and keep ourselves stuck and so you say you're saying both consciously and subconsciously Mm -hmm. and that's i think an important thing to notice is that like i think it's just like being able to identify with what we what we need in in any situation but i think most people would then create those patterns subconsciously Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. But. So you said a you said a specific word, and it comes down to need. And so when clients seek me out, 
the two biggest things that people say is I want to be more happy and I want to feel less stressed. And so when I ask people, well, define happiness for me, mm -hmm. they have a hard time defining what that is. And so we have this expectation that we want to wake up happy and we want to all of a sudden be happy, but we can't define what happiness is or we can't define what success means to us. Because at the end of the day, your success and my success and your happiness and my happiness are going to be completely different. And so going back to what you had said, it's that need versus want. When have you truly asked yourself what you want? We get stuck in our day to days. Okay. Yep. I got to wake up. Okay. I go to the gym. Okay. I prepare for this. Okay. I go to work. I pay my bills and we get stuck in this cycle and then expect that one day by doing all of these things, we're going to wake up being happy. But if you don't define what that parameter is, you can self-sabotage along the way. And so now going back to us doing it unconsciously, we don't realize we're doing it because we're trapped in that cycle. There's a lot to absorb right there. That was good. That was very good. I like that. So let's, let's take that back. So no, that, I mean, that's a great way to break that down mm -hmm. is being trapped in that cycle of the unknown or just maybe just the mindlessness of, of just going about our days kind of pushing through. Like, I mean, as I've gotten older, like it seems to be like, I know what I want more and more but I don't know how to get there necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there may be no clear path to how to get there. Like it's not, you know, it's not set in stone that we need to follow a certain pathway or a certain layout because everybody's going to be so different. But um, how would you say that like recognizing that that's the case and like being able to like internalize that up is doable you know, like it's hard to be, it's easy to go like, okay, I have this job. I'm going to work here for 35 years and then I'm going to retire. And then we're going to call it a day. Like, yeah. yeah, like 35 years is a long time. It's a long time. And, you know, just to, to do the same thing over and over, like a good friend of mine is just like, I, I was just talking to him recently about his job and he's just like, I've been doing it for like 10 years and like, I hate it. This is the same nonsense. It's stuck. Like I can't go up. There's no, you know, it's all like, there's not even like lateral moves in his job. He's just like, I can't go anywhere, mm -hmm. but he's at, you know, he's at a job that has a pension, all that good stuff. And he's just like, well, I got to just do something else. Cause he's realized that like, he can't just, you know, coast for the next 20 years doing what he's doing. Right. I think you said something that was extremely powerful just now where, a very old way of thinking and it's no it's no fault of our own because it's what culture and society has deemed appropriate is mm -hmm. thinking that a job is not only supposed to make you happy but that a job is supposed to make you happy for 35 years in doing the exact same thing yeah. day in and day out now don't get me wrong. There are individuals who absolutely love their job and still want to be doing the exact same thing. But the reason, one of the reasons of why those individuals are happy is because they recognize that their job doesn't have to define their happiness. It also doesn't define who they are as an individual because they recognize that a job for them is something that provides them financial security to be able to go and do the things that they want to be doing. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case for everyone. And in 2022, I mean, we saw it with the great resignation over the last couple of years with COVID and people making the decision to move jobs is recognizing something wasn't working for them. Yeah. When something isn't working, why are you trying to force it to work? If You've evaluated it. You've checked in with, okay, why isn't this working? Why am I making this change? How do I then make that next step or take that next step? You don't need to get to the end result, like you said, yeah. right? Because there's a lot of uncertainty of where that ultimate goal is. Yeah. All you have to figure out is how to take the first step. And so 
let's talk about uncertainty for a second because okay. a lot of our listeners here are those high achievers, right? Pushing themselves to the max, expecting a specific result. But in anything that we do, there is a level of uncertainty. We can't control others. We can't control unexpected circumstances that happen. However, the one thing you can control is how you choose to show up, how you choose to react to situations, to the uncertainties that happen. So when you mix the combination of perfectionism, which let's be real, as that high achiever, you're always trying to reach that perfect lifting weight or whatever it is that goal is, yep. you have a bit of an intolerance to uncertainty because you demand perfection. Yeah. And there's with weightlifting, something like weightlifting very specifically, there is a roadmap. Yes. And a very definitive roadmap. I get stronger. I lift more weight. I go to this competition yes. i get faster i run faster i go to this competition it's there's a definitive like trajectory right. that i don't think exists in real life on like a daily basis <laughs> okay so yes so that trajectory doesn't account for the fact that life happens and yeah. life brings uncertainty whether it is illness death in the family you having a shit day it doesn't mean that your progress is any less. It means you need to react differently. You need to be able to control how you choose to react to the trajectory that has slightly changed, which means it helps develop your flexibility. I'm, I'm trying to absorb all these things. <laughs> you say these things and I'm like, ah, damn, it's so well put <laughs> it, it's i don't even know what to say right now it's the way that you put things is is like almost so clear that it just like smacks you in the forehead and you're like now i have to reconsider my whole life or like <laughs> you know like parts of my life it's yeah it, you're you're very good at putting things in a perspective i find Thank and that's you. That's why I, I appreciate these conversations and I get lost in, in when you're saying things of like thinking about how that has impacted my life in different ways. Yeah. And I don't want to get like taken out of this conversation, but you know, you get those thoughts and it's like, Oh, like this is what I did in this situation and how I reacted to that. But going back to what you said and like how you approach each situation and how you choose to react to each situation, situation i'm stumbling over my words here <laughs> how you choose to react to each situation isn't is i think a very mature thing and i think that a lot of people don't have awareness around that mm -hmm. of like i i can sure as hell say i didn't when i was younger and i still don't at times when it like hits you hard same Listen, I've put in so much work and there are still times, and this is where I want people to understand, even when you put in the work, the work that you're also putting in is building self-compassion around your trips, around when you stumble because you've created this self-awareness and it's so easy to then get angry at yourself being like, I've worked through this already. Why do I have to work through this again? Or I can't believe I did this because I had caught myself doing it and I thought I could prevent it the next time. Mm -hmm. As you start to create self-awareness and as you start to implement changes, a crucial part of that is building self-compassion, understanding that you're human and when you know different, you do different. But until then, give yourself the kindness, just as if you would give kindness to a loved one, a close friend, or someone who means the world to you. Mm -hmm. That's, again, it's like one of those things you start, you say these things, and then I'm just thinking about like, how that impacts my life and how that and i hope people do the same thing and and can and be
be analytical of themselves and, and, and take these things that you're saying to heart. Yeah. Um, how do you identify the, the like self-sabotage behaviors either like while it's happening, like, can you do it while it's happening or is it something that's like, you have to look back on it and see it. Like, I feel like it's not an easy thing to do or like to course correct while you're kind of already down that path. It's interesting because there are going to, I mean, us even having the conversation right now and whoever's listening is going to recognize, okay, if this is something that I'm doing, I want to be able to pay attention to it. So going back to that self-compassion and when you get angry with yourself because you saw it happening, you're going to catch yourself in the moment and question yourself saying, is this me self-sabotaging right now? Is this me doing something to keep me stuck? Mm -hmm. And in those moments, that's when you need to start to ask yourself and use the information that's presented to you to ask yourself, what do you want? And in those moments, it may take some time. You don't need to figure it out yesterday, but being gracious with yourself so then you can ask that difficult question that you likely haven't asked yourself before or in a really long time. On the opposite end of it, if you've already experienced that stuckness and you've created that self-saboteur, essentially, mm -hmm. right? When you go back to reflect on the situation, think of it as... How can you grow or how can you do different the next time? And what is that one step that you know you can take to make a change? The worst thing that you can do is to sit and ruminate. And there is a huge difference when you look back at something and whether you're ruminating or you're reflecting. What's up guys, Justin here. I'm really sorry to interrupt the show, but we're here to talk about something special. This is to talk about Bionic. Bionic is a first of its kind AI based motion tracking mobility test that's designed to show you what your body is really doing. We've designed seven unique tests that show you your range of motion for different joints throughout your entire body and how they work together. Once you're done the test, you'll be given a body map score, which breaks down your entire body and their different range of motion. From there, the Wadproof app will also design a mobility program specifically tailored to your needs and the things you want to improve. I can't wait for you guys to try out the test. Go download the Wadproof app today, start your free seven day trial and try Bionic today. All right guys, back to the show. The worst thing that you can do is to sit and ruminate. And there is a huge difference when you look back at something and whether you're ruminating or you're reflecting. The difference, right, reflecting allows you to grow, to figure out what you need to do differently so you're not repeating the exact same thing. Rumination is what continues to keep you stuck because you only see yourself as a failure. You only see the negatives that have happened and it's harder to push through and find how do I keep an open mind and make the changes. This is the tough part. Yeah. This is the hard part is like, how do you, how would you get somebody to kind of make that step, you know, like, and, and be aware, like, is it, does that awareness come from within? Does it come from seeking out somebody like yourself? Does it come from, you know, listening to this podcast? Like, how do you trigger somebody to, to, to do that work and to, to have those thoughts as opposed to just the, the rumination? So it's interesting that you say that because when we get stuck in that rumination, then we think we did something wrong. And it is very easy to go back and blame ourselves. Well, we have to recognize that the thoughts that we're experiencing, the emotions that then come with those thoughts aren't facts. Mm -hmm. And when we can separate the two, we can then start to pay attention to what I like to call and what psychology likes to call unhelpful thinking styles. and these are things like catastrophizing or should or must statements or all or nothing thinking where it's black and white and you're only thinking in the extremes. And if you notice and 
recognize that, okay, this is where my thought is slipping into. I'm going to put it on hold. I'm not going to suppress it. We don't suppress our thoughts. <laughs> and our yeah. We're going to put that thought on hold and we're going to evaluate it. And we're going to evaluate it from a very neutral aspect of it. Now, in the moment when those things are happening, so let's say you're at the gym and you're getting ready to lift that next level weight, okay? And you're recognizing that that mental performance needs to kick in. If that initial thought comes in saying, well, I tried this the last time, I'm not going to be able to do it again, you're going to believe that. And when you believe that, you're never going to be able to then level up. Mm -hmm. So in that moment in time, something that you can do is what I like to call stop thought. And the stop thought is you putting that thought on hold to evaluate later and refocusing on what you need to do in that moment in time. So in that moment in time, that's you preparing yourself to lift that next weight, to yeah. step into your shoes, to feel your toes, to feel the fingers on that bar, it's bringing yourself back to that moment in time. Okay. Mm. Afterwards, yeah. you still have to go back and reflect on that thought that came up. You need to ask yourself, why was it not serving you? Why was that not a great thought to be thinking? So it takes the practice to understand, okay, the way I'm choosing to speak to myself is not the kindest way, is not the nicest way, but I need to understand why I'm saying those things and how can I then reframe them. So the stop thought then brings up that thought, brings up that emotion again the next time, and you have to set a timer. So it can be one minute, two minutes, five minutes, whatever amount of time you wanna set. And in that time, bring yourself back to you standing at the bar questioning your ability. Allow your brain to do its thing, which is worry. And in that last minute, you need to answer the questions that usually came up. What if I can't lift this weight? What will people think of me? What will I think of me? And when you answer those questions, it helps you start to reframe and it helps you start to acknowledge that the way that you've been thinking isn't the most helpful. When you create awareness around how you think, it comes from you wanting to make a change, recognizing the way that you've been speaking to yourself hasn't been working. And that also comes with speaking with friends, speaking with a coach, speaking with someone who you absolutely trust, where you can create a safe space and be vulnerable. Like, okay, there is so much in that. And I just let you go. I didn't want to stop that at all because that was that was so good. And as an athlete, as a coach, as a photographer, as, as like a person mm -hmm. who has done anything ever, like that is all so valuable. Because there's something in your life that you can take a pic take a picture of, take a, a snapshot of, a moment that you can take a snapshot of and apply that in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Like I was lifting weights today and I'm like, you know, how did I talk to myself approaching the bar? How did I frame things in my mind? You know, versus, you know, sometimes I'll talk to my athletes and, and different people that I work with. And I'm like, you, you've missed this lift five minutes ago because you've already put these thoughts in your head, you know, focus yeah on the things you need to focus on in that moment, mm -hmm. there's, there's too much thought around what if, especially in training Yes. of what if that this doesn't happen? What if I didn't, what will people think of me? How will I be perceived if I don't do X, Y, Z thing? And I've had so many conversations with athletes about this and it's like, it's, it's, you know, they need to think about it and they need to like realize it, like what the actual implications are, yeah. not what they're just thinking. Like if you go and miss a lift, okay. Were you safe and you missed it? Yeah. Okay. Were you unsafe and you did something dumb? 
Okay, that's that's different. But if you you know you did what you were supposed to do, and you're already telling yourself you can't do it ten minutes before you even start to try, it's like you're probably going to fail before you should. Mm-hmm. And it has nothing to do with the physical capabilities of that person. It has all to do with it's what's between their ears. And I feel like working with athletes, the more and more I think about it, the more it's between their ears. And there are physical limitations, no questions. There's physical limitations on people. And like there's times where people have no business doing some things that they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Or they're being overly encouraged even though they have no business, they're being overly encouraged by their surroundings because it's like a hype train and not like a, uh, the idea isn't the right focus. The idea is like everybody's just rah, 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 rooting for you, but you're not physically prepared for what you're about to do. Yes. That is different. The that mental is- side of it. Yeah. That is. Sorry, a- Sorry I'm going to cut you off for a second because that yeah. is like my pet peeve when it comes to hyping people up and encouraging. There's yeah. a massive difference between informed optimism and toxic positivity. So let's go there for a moment. <laughs> okay. Okay. So no, no, let's, let's go there. I do appreciate that. And I find that that does happen often yes. in the CrossFit environment because yes. like as a coach, I'm, <laughs> I've been told I wear my emotions on my face very easily. And I will literally be like, oh, no, like, do not do that. But then I will look at a different coach and they're like, let's go. Let's go. And I'm like, let's not do that. Right. Right. So from your perspective, from the physical side of it, there's a huge safety concerns because yeah. you, can, you can visually see that. OK, mm-hmm. so let's now talk about the safety concerns around toxic positivity. When someone experiences toxic positivity, they have a false sense of what they're truly capable of. So when they do fail or when mistakes happen or whatever it is that goes on to cause a mishap or something that's different from what they expected, they hit a lower low because it was inflated with a false sense of hope. So let me give an analogy about a difference between toxic positivity and informed optimism. Okay. We're on the West Coast of British Columbia. It rains all the time. Okay. So let's picture ourselves. We're outside walking around and it's raining outside. Okay. Toxic positivity is saying it's sunny outside. It's sunny outside. It's sunny outside. Right. Informed optimism is looking up and saying there's clouds here. There's sun beyond and it'll shine again. Mm-hmm. That's the difference between toxic positivity and informed optimism. Toxic positivity is that false sense that you need to force yourself to think and to see something that you're not actually seeing. When that happens, yeah. you can cause self-sabotage to happen so much more. So that low of low that ends up happening, it becomes that much harder to be able to pick yourself up because you falsely thought that you would be able to do it the first time. But what if we set realistic expectations instead of unrealistic expectations? Yeah. You can still say, you know what, I had a really crappy day, but this is what went well. This is what sucked. That's informed optimism, knowing that the things that went well you can still find them and you can replicate them again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I like that. No, but that's, it's true. Like you, you start to think back on those times in your life where you gave yourself that, like that, um, that, that toxic positivity for, you know, the expectations that were put on you from an external source or whatever, or the expectations that you thought were put on you from an external source that really weren't there. It was just like, I have to do this because they think I need to do this where it's like, no, it's like, you know, and and then like, if we tie it back to, to CrossFit, which I don't necessarily need to do, we can tie it to anything, but it's like, you know, if there's a competition, that's a different thing, right? Like you ha- you're trying to excel. It's a competition environment that's different mm-hmm. than training every day or going to 
lecture and like I had to learn this today and I didn't learn this today. So it's like, OK, well, you know, you you can still learn it again or yeah. train f to improve on these things. But it's the ideas that we're creating and the the stories that we're telling ourselves that are actually impacting us more mm -hmm. than like not making that lift or not whatever. Right. So let's bring this to mental performance then, because you had mentioned how competition is slightly different from training day. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about mental performance in how we choose to train, because just as if you're training yourself physically, you have to train mentally as well. And that means training not just on the bad days, but on the good days as well. So you don't just train your thoughts when shitty things happen, you train your thoughts when good things happen as well. So the way that I like to put the analogy behind mental performance and thoughts and reframing is you don't just show up to a competition expecting to win, right? Mm -hmm. You go to training, you learn the steps, you push yourself, you yeah. build on that knowledge. The same thing happens when you practice mental performance. It's mental training at the end of the day. And picture a bad day, that self-saboteur coming out and trying to pull you down. That's your competition. So you can't show up and be 100% you if you don't train leading up to that. Do you find that a lot of people show up expecting to do things when they haven't prepared for it? Yeah, 100%. They expect themselves to think differently. They expect themselves to change their inner voice. They expect that because they went over it once that they should know differently at that point in time. And so people get frustrated. And I say this right from the get-go when I coach anyone is I tell them right off the bat, the questions that I'm going to ask you is going to frustrate you. Months into this, when you have a low point, you're going to get frustrated and you can get frustrated at the situation. You can get frustrated at me. But what I need you to recognize is, is that within that frustration comes growth as well. And I'll show you how that growth exists, but you have to go through the frustrations as well as the good days. Okay. There's another bomb you just dropped. <laughs> All right. Great today. I love it. This is, we're rolling here. This is good. This is good. Yeah. Um, the, you know, we grow from the struggles and I appreciate that we, that we all, and I think everybody appreciates that we grow from the struggles. Yeah. It's, I've seen it the most is when people don't learn from their struggles and they don't learn from their failures or their understanding of their expectations. It's almost, frustrating because it's like it's right in front of you mm -hmm. but they don't see that connection like do you see that from time to time working with clients like i mean i've seen it working with athletes where it's like they're expecting themselves to do something with no preparation for it mm -hmm. not even necessarily the skill set to do it or you know whatever and then they're disappointed that they didn't do it and then they don't learn that lesson that they need to prepare for it. And then they just go and try and do it again. And they're like, well, I couldn't do it, but I, you know, I didn't do it the last time and I didn't do it this time. It's like, but there, you didn't do anything in between to like get you to the point to do it. Yeah. That's a form of self-sabotage right there because it's easier to say, well, I failed once I'll fail again. And your expectations stay low. So you never have to lift your expectations at that point. And so that's an unconscious self-saboteur coming out. There's two types of individuals who can experience it. The one where it's, I'm expecting as that high achiever that something needs to come easily to me. And so you get frustrated because you don't think you need to put in the work. Mm -hmm. Then there's the other individuals who can use it as an excuse and it's being used subconsciously on why you can't get better. And that just comes back to what do I want? What's a priority in my life? And it may be that lifting at that point in time, doing CrossFit, doing whatever it is at that point in time may not be a priority because there's other things going on. But you don't need to use that as an excuse. I want to go back to something. I jotted it down really quickly. When you said growing from struggles, in order to step out and build 
our confidence instead of beating ourselves down, we also have to grow from our successes. We can't just grow from our struggles because for those of us who experience, and this goes back to talking about imposter syndrome and self-sabotage, it is easier to find what went wrong and keep that in the back of our mind. For some people that can be used as a motivator, but for individuals where they have that self-sabotaging behavior, they experience imposter syndrome, the growth from struggles only sees the struggles. And so those are the individuals who have to savor in their successes, recognize that this did go well, and I can repeat and replicate this. And so when you get stuck in self-sabotage, you have to remind yourself, I am capable. I have the skills. I have the knowledge to be able to try something new when I get stuck in a challenge, whatever it may be. So you have to grow from both struggles and success. That's so good. Because it's true. Like we, you know, we hear about the grind. We hear about the the negative, not necessarily negative, but you hear about the, you know, like all the people who just embrace the grind, embrace the struggle and all that kind of stuff. And that that's great. Like, and there is a lot to learn from that. But yes. what you just said, it's like, yeah, like I, I've, I've gone through a lot with business that for, for many reasons, like I saw it as a negative and the people that were involved with it, it like, it messed me up, but looking and reflecting, I've learned more in my life mm -hmm. than any school, any, you know, person had ever taught me before being in that business situation. Mm -hmm. Like you can't experience that kind of stuff. And I've never, I, yeah, you can't experience these things in that environment. You don't learn in a school environment. You have to learn from, from experience. Mm -hmm. And I find it hard to look back on the successes that we had when we were, when it was going and learn from that. But now that you say that, it's like, yeah. Like it's hard to recognize the good at the time, mm -hmm. recognize all the negative, but like I, you know, I was looking back at pictures from my old business and I'm like, damn, we had something, we had something special. We had a place that was special and it, it's like hard to internalize that because of all the struggles that were around it at times. Mm -hmm. And so like when you say that, it's like, yeah, I, I learned a lot from my failures, but like I almost need to go back and think about what I learned and what I experienced from those successes. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like the, the balance of like the value was like so much heavier of like on the negatives and not on the positives. So for anything bad that happens, there's research that's out there. So if you, let's say you receive a shitty comment from someone or a bad Google <laughs> review, you yeah. need, three positive things to outweigh that one bad. So mm -hmm. that's what I mean in savoring your success and savoring in those positives as well is because you don't realize the memory that you're making until you're way far gone. Because at that point, our brain excludes the negatives. Mm -hmm. so when we're looking forward, or sorry, when we're in the forward in our present time and we're looking back and we're reflecting, if we're far enough past and we've healed from that struggle, that's when nostalgia starts to kick in, right? And we remember, okay, this was so good. And we forget the negatives. But when we're in the present getting anxious about the future, all we can see are the negatives. And if we can combine the two of them and prepare our mind to be able to then show up to what we need to do with what's in front of us, if that's lifting the next weight, then that's what's going to remind us of our capability. That's what's going to level up our strength. And this goes back to right what, we, what you had said in the beginning. You could have the physical strength, but unless you show up with a mental game, and ready to practice that mental performance for competition day, 
it's never going to become simple. It's never going to register to a point where you're like, I got this. And you truly yeah. believe in yourself. Damn. Well, you got to do this to me. It's every five minutes. I'm like, oh, more things to do and consider and think about. And it's the truth. And like, as a coach, as an athlete, all these things, it like factors into improving performance and improving, um, the, the, the ecosystem, like everything involved in it. Yeah. And it's, I don't know if there's a better word, but like the whole ecosystem of, of like relationships and talk like, damn, there's, there's so much to go through and there's so much to learn. And what you're saying is, is like, you know, I, I am going to have to go back and listen to this again. And usually I hate to say this. I don't really re-listen to my, my podcast that much. Mm -hmm. But there's so much that like from a coaching standpoint and from a personal standpoint that, that I've like realized just from talking to you, you know, mm -hmm. for the last 40 minutes here. Yeah. And it's like, it's so eye opening that what you bring to the table here and it's, it, it's more simple coming out of you than it is like trying to process it yourself. Like you've, you very eloquently put a lot of things here that make you consider a lot of variables and like things that you, you, how we treat ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, even on your social media and the things that you put on your social media, your Instagram, your TikTok, like it may be six seconds, but every time that I see some of those videos, I'm like, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and it's, you know, like this is practice. Like, I mean, I'm sure you have this idea and you're like, boom, I'm going to make this video now. And you, you know, you found this, this system that works for you. But like for other people, it's like, wait. I have I've had to go back and watch some of your stuff like two or three times and be like, hmm. Yeah, okay. Now it's not a lot of time in my life. It's like 10 seconds. But it's like those little things I I'm personally trying to be more aware of. And and it helps so much with people like you being there to just very, very elegantly put it and very simply put it where it like kicks you in the face. <laughs> I love that. And thank, thank you for acknowledging that. That Honestly, that is what my huge mission is with mm -hmm. what I'm doing and why I'm rebranding and opening up this space for everyone globally. And the reason for it is when you're watching it on repeat, that's when things start to connect because sometimes that's what we need to hear are those same things over again until we finally get it. Mm -hmm. And as long as everyone recognizes that they are a lifelong student, then it becomes that much easier to allow for growth to happen. Yeah. The moment that you decide that you've learned all you can learn that's the moment that you've closed your mind. Mm -hmm. And as humans, in relationships, in friendships, in business partnerships, in a ship with yourself, we are constantly evolving as humans. And so getting right back to that initial question of asking yourself, what do you want? If you can step into that and own it, you can start to build your confidence in all aspects of life. Damn. <laughs> I love it. That's so, it's so good. I, uh, I think we should wrap it up on that because that's okay. a good thought process and that's a good that's a good little bow on that on this episode and we will definitely have you back on again um damn thank you so much this was great and i this has been my favorite episode and i mean we, we talk all the time but having people on like you who are so passionate about what they do and believe in and are able to talk about 
the topic so well. It's, it's, it's awesome. And this is why I love doing this. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me back again because there are times where we can get super stuck and we don't have to be there. And as long as we know that we can have these open and honest and vulnerable conversations, then you're one more step further to making those changes. So thank you again for creating this space to be able to have these conversations. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, okay. So at Dr. Jessica Metcalf on Instagram, if you yes. want to find out more and mm -hmm. then, what is your TikTok handle? Because you use that quite a bit as well. I do. It's at the Alchemist Mind. Alchemist Mind. Okay. So, Dr. Jessica Metcalf, thank you so much for joining us. And we will, I'm, we'll catch up again soon. I'm sure we'll have you on again. 100%. Thank you again, too. All right. Take care, guys. Have a good week.